Finally, I would like to thank my wife, Catherine Jean Wolfla. We met in high school, dated in college, married in medical school, and she has supported me for the last 24 years. Thank you, Kathy. The past. The 1933 Chicago World's Fair was called a century of progress. Highlights included Homes of Tomorrow, Arrival of the Graf Zeppelin, and Art Modern Architecture, uh, something that is, or a style reflected in the artwork for this meeting. The theme of the 1933 Chicago World's Fair was Science Finds, Industry Applies, and Man Adapts. The artwork for that meeting reflected not only an expectation of a technological future, but also optimism and an appreciation of aesthetics. The first half of the 20th century is dominated by these things, by these themes. The achievements of science and the application of technology would yield a new, better world of prosperity, intellectual freedom c complete with individualized push-button education, abundant health, including flying hospitals, and even hospitals in space, voice recognition software that actually works, and of course, flying cars, lots of flying cars. The 1933 World's Fair was so successful that it was held over through 1934. So where are those flying cars? What happened to that future? The present. Why are we here and not here? Is our world better or worse than the one that was envisioned? I would submit that the answer is neither, just different. Sure, we don't have flying cars, although we could, and the reason we don't, we don't isn't because we don't know how to make them either. And here's one you can buy right now. The biggest reason is that we haven't figured out how we're going to power our flying cars. We are still using fossil, the same fossil fuels that we were in 1933, and it turns out they're a limited resource. As you can see, oil consumption has exceeded discovery since the 1980s. We do have some technology that wasn't envisioned. Powerful computers on everyone's desk, in everyone's pocket, and in everyone's car, even in our toys and toothbrushes. And each one of these objects in this slide has more computing power than the Apollo 11 spacecraft. We also have instantaneous global communication at our fingertips. And unlike for Captain Kirk, it doesn't require constant adjusting. In neurosurgery, we have amazing two new technologies, the operating microscope, intracranial stents and coils, stereotactic radio surgery, and neuronavigation. These things allow us to treat conditions we could have never effectively treat in the past, including refractory Parkinson's disease, deep-seated tumors and vascular malformations, and spinal deformity and the beginnings of knowledge about how to use these treatments effectively, including evidence-based guidelines, outcomes research, and patient registries. And these things are only the tip of the iceberg. These things allow us to treat more patients more effectively, and that is, after all, what we train to do. Yet, there are problems. Like fossil fuels, it turns out that neurosurgical care is also a limited resource. There are a limited number of neurosurgeons, and there is already a shortage. This chart shows projections for all physicians, including or indicating that there is already a shortage. The, number of the numbers for neurosurgeons are actually worse, because it is a small specialty that has always limited its numbers with a long training period. And there are only finite amounts of money to pay for neurosurgical care. There is already a shortage of that, too. And we reached that point a long time ago. This graph shows the difference between Medicare spending and revenue sources expressed as a percentage of total spending. The last time this system broke even was in the 1970s and was operating at nearly 50% deficit in 2011. To put it a different way, Medicare spends $2 for every dollar it takes in. Given that, how do we get from here to there? How do we get the future we want? The future. Why should, we be, why should we even be concerned about the future? After all, it has been said that whoever builds a house for future happiness builds a prison for the future. 
And we should be proud of what we achieve, have achieved as a profession. We have a heritage of helping people with the most difficult problems in the most dire situations, a tradition of being the best and the brightest, and a history of research and clinical edu innovation. However, it is equally true that we should all be concerned about the future because we will have to spend the rest of our lives there. So what do we need to do to get the future we want? First, uh, to quote Dr. Roberto Hiros, let's not throw the baby out with the bath water. We must remember why we became neurosurgeons. We must provide the best care we know how. We shouldn't waste resources, but we also should not stop ever advocating for individual patients. We must seek treatments for incurable conditions and seek better treatments for curable ones. But if we're going to move forward, that is not enough. There are a number of issues that we will need to address, and here are two important ones. First, we have adopted the wrong strategy for controlling health care spending, and I will tell you why. Economics 101, supply and demand. In a free market, supply, demand, and price are at equilibrium. When the price is above equilibrium, a shortage results, or excuse me, a surplus results. When the, supply fall, when the price falls below equilibrium, a shortage results. Current policy, policy decisions appear to be based on the assumption that the price of health care is too high. Of course, in a free market, this cannot happen for very long, as market forces would drive the price back down. But of course, this isn't a free market. Current strategies to address health care costs all seem to involve decreased reimbursement and initiatives designed to increase quality. Most of the latter also increase practice costs. So what does basic economics say about these strategies? All policies that decrease reimbursement and or increase practice costs both increase price and decrease supply over the long term. This shifts the supply curve up, and at all prices, the quantity produced is decreased. All actions that increase quality, on the other hand, shift the demand curve to the right because a presumably better product is being produced. At all prices, demand is increased. The net effect is predictably a new structure where, at the previously unacceptably high price, surplus turns to shortage. Consumers dissatisfied by shortage will invariably drive the price up to reestablish equilibrium. Most importantly, the demand for health care has been shown to be relatively inelastic. Therefore, any increase in price will always lead to an increase in total spending, exactly the opposite effect that was from the one that was desired. There are only two ways to reduce the price of health care. You can reduce demand or you can increase supply, period. There are no others. On the demand side, we could certainly decrease the quality of care or tell people to stop getting sick or tell people to stop taking care of themselves when they do. And none of these things are going to work in the United States and it would be counterproductive to even try. On the supply side, we could certainly make more physicians and we could certainly pay them more fairly. But I think the real strategy lies in reduction of the cost of doing business. How do you reduce the cost of doing business? Number one, abolish unfund unfunded mandates as they provide no health care for the most part to patients. Things like the PQRS initiative, HIPAA, ICD-10, and meaningful use criteria. And number two, enact real medical liability reform which has a dual effect of decreasing liability insurance premiums, which are passed directly to the consumer, and eliminates defensive medicine, estimated to cost 70 to $126 billion per year in the United States as of 2003. We must strongly continue to advocate for these things, not just through the CNS and AANS, but also at the state and local level through the CSNS, through personal contacts, and by voting in every single election. Second, technology is not our enemy. There is a reason we do this and not this. It just simply works better. It makes the treatable untreatable and makes our treatments more effective. That is what we do. Arthur Clarke once said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and we want magic. We don't want to be stuck with 20th century medicine forever. Yes, there is a benefit to refining the indications for our current treatments through guidelines and outcome studies. However, the reality is that the current state of the art leaves much to be desired. 
Many of our patients do not have an effective, long-lasting, and or safe treatment option for their condition. Progress lies not in enhancing what is, but in, but in advancing what will be. If we want neurosurgery of the future, we need to develop new technologies into actual patient treatments. So what are some of the barriers to new technology? I would submit that neurosurgeons are not the problem. We are the innovators. We have always been the early adopters. The principal barriers to the development of new technology are in research, regulations, and utilization. In research, we have observed a decrease in internal funds available for academic research. We have observed an increased focus on clinical productivity over research at academic institutions, and a decline in real dollars in NIH research funding. And as you can see, NIH, fun NIH funding in real dollars has been decreasing for nearly a decade. What about industry research funding? Over the last decade, we have seen incre an increased awareness of potential bias resulting from conflicts of interest in medical research, including this 2009 report by the Institute of Medicine. Unfortunately, in many cases, the presence of potential conflicts of interest has become equated with the presence of bias in many instance instances. As a result, a recent study showed that a recent study showed that surveyed physicians downgraded the credibility of industry-funded research, potentially hindering translation of results into practice. What about regulation? All new technology must be approved by the FDA. For devices, there are two primary processes, the 510K process and the pre-market approval process. The 510K process is for devices substantially equivalent to previously approved devices. It is supposed to be used for low and moderate risk devices and does not generally require clinical trials. In contrast, the pre-market approval process is supposed to be for high risk devices and require clinical trials. It may also require both bench and animal testing as well as possible biocompatibility testing. Approval is both costly and lengthy. A 2010 survey found that the cost of obtaining FDA approval for new devices was an average of $31 million when approved through the 510K process and $94 million when approved through the pre-market approval process and, took, and this process took two to seven years. This is compared with Asia, where approval might require $3 million, $3 million in five years, or Europe, where it might require $2 million in less than one year. Given this, is it any wonder that a lot of our new, new devices look a lot like the old ones? Or that implant materials have hardly changed in the last 20 years? Or that medical technology is so expensive in the United States? Or that a great deal of clinical research is now being done outside the United States? The current system facilitates these things. And ladies and gentlemen, people do what they are incentivized to do. Finally, utilization. Medical technology is highly valued as a beloved feature of American medicine. Our patients expect it. 40% of, Amer of Americans believe that medical technology can always save their lives, and quite frankly, I am one of them. But it is also thought that new or increased use of medical technology contributes 40 to 50% to annual cost increases, and that controlling this technology is the most important factor in reducing them. And as a result, even the Congressional Budget, Budget Office has studied the issue of technology and medicine. The CBO has concluded that spending can only be controlled if new technology is adapted more selectively and the diffusion of new technology is slowed, presumably by Congress. So if pro is the opposite of con, what is the opposite of progress? You guys figure that one out. And this strategy seems fundamentally flawed to me. If you believe that, health, that the health care you have now leaves much to be desired, why would you want to hold back progress? And this strategy also completely ignores the pricing life cycle of med medical technology. Even today's, oh, that's interesting. That third word should be old and not world. Yeah, that'll mess me up. <laughs> yeah. Very good. 
Thank you. Even today's old and cost-effective technology was new and expensive once. That is the cost of progress. Unfortunately, when you see that in order to produce, you need to obtain permission from men who produce nothing, your society may know that it's doomed, and that is as true now as it was in 1957. So, how do we get the technology, technological future we want? We are going to have to work for it. We must incentivize innovation and preserve the value of neurosurgeons as researchers. We must support public funding for neurosurgical research and develop strategies to enhance industry funding for neurosurgical research. We must break down the regulatory and cost barriers associated with bringing new technology to market, barriers that drive up the cost of new technology, barriers that discourage revolutionary technology in favor of evolutionary technology. We must validate the best, most effective use of established technology and discourage the use of ineffective treatments and especially quackery. We must discourage the use of unproven treatments outside of research and fight to put decisions regarding medical technology back into the hands of patients and doctors where they belong. Finally, we must get over our fear of new technology, disseminate new technology through education, and, main, and work to maintain awareness of the value of new technology in the eyes of the public, payers, and government. Because there is one group of people that consistently recognizes the value of what we do, and that is our patients. If we want to move from here to here, we are going to have to work for it, and we may have to be more like the turtle. He makes progress only when he sticks his neck out. Thank you very much. Is that okay? How long did that take? We were tweaking the sound out while you were speaking. But, uh, yeah, I could tell. Yeah. Sound. Okay. We had a little too much tent or tinny, you know, sound in okay. the speaker. And that was 19 minutes, so that's, and I think I have 20, so that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right, should I do that one more time? One more time. Who's, sitting, who's sitting there with you? Deanne. Oh, hi, Deanne. <laughs> Why? Really? Oh, I did. Take a breath before I read the quote. Okay. Oh, well, that's bad. Yeah, let's just reset the, yeah. I'll reset this. I'm sure by then they'll be good and behind anyway, so we'll probably, so having it be 19 minutes is probably just fine. <laughs> yeah, but they'll appreciate not having to stay any longer. They'll appreciate the minute you give them back, but they're not going to leave until you finish. Wow, look at the back of my head. I don't have any hair at all. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, okay. So, how's this work? Is this the way it's going to be for the for the thing? Like, my picture is going to be there, yep. and then this is, and the slides are going to be here. Unless you want some other way. I like. You like it that way? Well, let me think about that. All right, I'll just. Uh, yeah, during the regular meeting, we're going to basically put the iMag up for a few minutes. Uh huh. And then we're going to switch to science since there's quite a bit of science to do. Uh huh. You, yours is more graphical in nature. Uh huh. Uh, and being that it is discussing some graphs, we're going to use you as a full time. Okay, all right. I'm just not much to look at. <laughs> uh huh. All right. Good morning. It is my privilege to be here today. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge a few of the many people that have helped get me to this point. Uh, I do not have any disclosures this morning. And further, these are my own personal views and don't represent, necessarily represent the views of the Congress. To begin, I would like to acknowledge all CNS members, 
as well as CNS Executive Committee members, both present and past. I want to thank our dedicated, talented, and hardworking staff at the CNS Home Office, our honored guest, Dr. Ralph Dacey, and Distinguished Service Award recipient, Dr. Joel McDonald. I want to remember our immediate past president, Dr. Christopher Getch, who tragically passed away this year. I would also like to encourage all of you to contribute to the Getch Educational Fund, set up to fund college educations for his children. If any of you would like me to send you the address, please email me here. This is my home email address. I would also like to remember my mentor, Dr. Sanford Larson, who was chair at the medical college for 36 years, who also passed away earlier this year. Thank you to Dr. Paul McCormick, AANS past president, and Dr. Mitch Berger, current AANS president. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with both of you uh, this year. Thank you to my partners who have been so tolerant of my crazy schedule over the last year. Thank you to all the special people I work with at Freighter and the Medical College. I want to thank Dr. Nobuhitu Saito, President of the Japanese Congress of Neurological Surgery, and Dr. Edwards Varina, President of the Central European Neurosurgical Society, our partner society for this meeting. I want to thank my mentors.